A huge white castle with blue roofs disappeared into the mountains behind the forest. Moonlight reflected off the peaks on the tops of the roofs. In one of the rooms of the castle, a man sighed wearily and put his head on a stack of papers on the table. The old man had a grey beard on his face and glasses on the bridge of his nose. The man wondered what he should do, because the people will soon begin to starve, and the duke does not care and he does not try to prevent it in any way. Suddenly, a huge fiery comet flew into the castle. From the noise and the flash, the old man got up from the table and looked out the window opposite him. He watched in horror as people ran in panic in different directions, and some of the wounded fell to the ground and lay in a pool of their blood. Unknown knights in protective helmets covering their face with swords attacked civilians and killed them. The old man realized in horror that these were the knights of the Imperial Army. A huge grey-haired old man with a long beard and a crown on his head ominously watched what was happening. A crowd of magicians stood on the walls of the fence protecting the castle, raised their hands to the sky and began to recite some spells. The old man recognized the main magician as Emperor Ziran and called him a fucking bastard. Another dozen comets flew at the castle again. The old man ran to the duke. He stood on the high roof and watched what was happening. The old man began to beg his head to escape from the roof as soon as possible. At that moment, one of the shells hit the castle tower. The next comet flew into the old man's room. The last thing he shouted was for the duke. This is how the land of Bran fell, a useless piece of land on the outskirts of the empire. Suddenly, a young guy with bright red hair jumped out of bed. Along with the empire, the main character, the butler of the local duke, also died. Looking in the mirror, the man saw a young handsome guy. He realized that he should have died, but he was reborn into the body of a young duke 20 years before the death of the earth. It's been a whole day since the old man was reborn into Duke Aaron's body. The guy was sitting on the bed with his hands clutching his head. Being in a broken state and completely misunderstanding what was happening, he did not eat or drink anything. I didn't talk to anyone. The main character spent the second day cursing the emperor, who killed him and all the inhabitants of Bran. The main character fell asleep and woke up delirious, wondering how to take revenge on him. On the third day, the old man finally calmed down, gathered his strength, got out of bed, got dressed, because he realized that he had a chance to change everything. Then he had to dig into books to find out everything about the duke in his early years. The old man was determined to prevent the impending horror, and a few days later, the main character was forced to stop severe hunger. The old man was holding a whole loaf of bread in his hands, clutching it in his hands and looking at it intently. He thought that while he had spent his whole life for the benefit of the poor, who could not even afford a piece of bread, the duke had never cared about anyone but himself. As if those people weren't his subjects. A girl with red hair in a beautiful pink dress and a black headband flew into the room. She began to scream at the main character in fear, asking why he was clutching a loaf of bread in his hands. This girl was Cheryl, Aaron's younger sister and a former imperial princess. She talked about how she spent so much time getting the guy out of the room so that he wouldn't get hungry, but he didn't eat and did strange things with food. The guy laughed, apologized to the girl and said that he was doing it just because it would be more convenient to chew bread. But it was clear from the guy's face that he was panicking and trying not to give himself away. Then he asked the girl if she was free today, as he wanted to go to the same place with her. The girl asked her brother with disdain and disbelief about where he wanted to take her. The main character, along with his sister and a bodyguard, were standing on the street. The man reported to Aaron for the work he had done. He said that, on the duke's orders, he was engaged in providing them with food. This man was Rommel, a swordsman who is the unofficial captain of the knights. The man asked why the duke had called him to this place in full armor. In response, Aaron replied that Emperor Ziran was planning to destroy their land. Upon hearing this, Rommel and Cheryl were horrified and could not believe their ears. The girl began to talk about the fact that the emperor, who was also her uncle, had sworn an oath to their father, which he would not benefit from breaking. In response, Aaron replied that the Emperor probably thinks that they will want to exercise their right to the throne. On top of everything else, he added that he had personally been informed that the Emperor was planning to break his promise. After a short pause, Aaron said that he thought it was time to use the dragon's blessing. Aaron's sister looked askance at Rommel and told her brother that he was going to hide the dragon's blessing like an ace up his sleeve until the last moment. Aaron said that to the last did not include betraying the Emperor. After that, he asked his sister and the knight if they were ready to move out. Cheryl thought it was a strange decision, but her brother never let words go to waste, and so she trusted him. The girl picked up her staff, at the end of which was an imitation flower. She pointed this staff forward. The crystal inside the flower glowed and blue energy began to radiate from it. Because of this, a portal opened that led to some other dimension. Suddenly, Rommel called out to Mrs. Cheryl in a panic. The girl turned around and looked questioningly at the knight. It turns out that, unofficially, Cheryl was a magician, but Rommel did not know about this and therefore was very surprised. She remembered that she hadn't told the man about it and smiled. After entering the portal, 
All three found themselves on a snow-covered mountain in the frosty lands. After that, the girl stopped, began to stretch her arms, still holding her red magic staff in her hands. The men stood behind Cheryl. The girl asked them not to judge her harshly, as she had not practiced for a long time. After that, the girl raised her hand with her palm to the sky and a lump of fire came out of it into the sky. This ball became bigger and took the shape of eyes and mouth. At that moment, the girl began to wave her staff. The fire began to change its shape and then completely split into several small balls. Rommel, who was watching this, realized in shock that the inferno ring was in front of him. After that, with a wave of Cheryl's hand, the ring turned into a huge ball of fire again and crashed into the mountains, leaving behind a large footprint. Rommel stared in shock at the dent left in the mountain. Cheryl turned back to the men and said it was weak, just above the seventh circle. Shocked, Rommel asked the girl if he understood correctly that she was a magician of the seventh circle. The girl replied positively, but suggested that it would be too little to defeat the emperor's army. Aaron cleared his throat to clear his throat and said that it really wouldn't be enough. He also added that they will have a lot of time to gain strength. But in fact, the man was thinking that in Aaron's diary it was said that the girl is a magician of the fifth circle, but in fact she is an archmage. After that, Cheryl added that compared to her brother, what she does is toys. Rommel, still in shock, turned to the duke and asked him if his sister's words were true. Aaron smiled and said that now they will find out the answer to this question. The man was worried and gathered his strength to try magic. Yesterday, reading Aaron's diaries, the man learned that thanks to the blessing of the dragon, Aaron's sister became a magician of the fifth circle and the duke himself became a grand master warrior. In this case, it turns out that being in Aaron's body, the man also possesses this power. He got up from the table and went to the bookshelf. He took out a book called Fundamentals of Imperial Fencing and looked at it and thought that he was unlikely to become the best swordsman right away and he should start with the basics. Standing on a snowy mountain, the man picked up his sword, raised it to the sky and prepared to test his magic. He stepped forward, gripped the sword with both hands tighter, and the same blue energy as his sisters began to emanate from it. Aaron shouted and announced the third version of the great sword art called Piercing Wind and waved the blade in the air. A wave of energy headed into the mountains opposite the man and cut off their tops. Pleased with himself, the man sheathed his sword and smiled, mumbled and turned to Rommel and Cheryl. However, he thought to himself that he was actually aiming at another mountain, but he was also satisfied with this result. Rommel opened his mouth in shock and stared at the mountains. He couldn't believe his eyes. The dragon flew in the sky over the land of Bran. He realized that there was a trace of the blessing he had left here a few years ago in this city and was surprised by it. After that, the dragon flew down to the castle like a bullet. He landed on the ground and turned into an old man. He examined his body and called it an excellent vessel. Holding a black fan in his hands and waving it in front of his face, the man looked at the castle, hiding behind the trees in the forest. He decided that it was time for him to meet the people he had once blessed. A few days before the old man decided to become a duke, he found Aaron's diary in the library. Opening the thin binding, he began to read it. A few years ago, with the help of the Lord Feudal Lord, Aaron's father's brother, Uncle Jaron, took away Aaron's weakened old father's right to the throne. And soon the father of the family died, so Aaron and Cheryl had to escape from the persecution of the authority. The reason why the siblings were able to survive was because of the only condition their father put forward to his brother in order to protect his children. The condition stated that Aaron and Cheryl would not claim the throne and on this basis, the emperor should allow Aaron to become the duke of the land of Bran at the edge of the empire. Bran's land was a barren land with a decrepit fortress on it. Hundreds of scary monsters fled to the lands. Nothing grew on that land, and monsters were constantly attacking. Thanks to the dragon's blessing, Cheryl and Aaron wield the power of the Grand Master. They have enough strength to establish life on the land of Bran. But Aaron decided to hide his abilities for the rest of his life in order to keep the promise made by his father. After finishing reading the diary, the main character closed the thin book. The old man was angry with the duke because some promise was more precious to him than the lives of his subjects, whom he refused to save during the emperor's attack. Currently, in the fortress of the land of Bran, a stranger grabbed the boy's hand. He used some kind of abilities on him, after which the boy realized that his arm no longer hurt. He looked at his healer in surprise. She was a beautiful tall girl with white hair and a purple robe. She told the boy to play more carefully in the future, otherwise his parents would worry. The boy said he would follow the girl's advice. The healer turned out to be a girl named Cecilia, 21 years old and a saint of the Vivian Order. She bent down to the boy, stroked his head and called him a good and smart boy. Suddenly, the herald announced that everyone should gather in the square in order to listen to the duke, who was going to make a speech. The girl turned at the sound and walked towards the square. The duke was standing on a high stone. There were guards behind him. Aaron himself looked at the people of his land and stood facing them. People in the crowd were talking and could not understand what he needed and what kind of speech he was going to make. 
They thought that the duke would talk some nonsense again and maybe even raise taxes, which angered and upset the population. Someone in the crowd asked the other men if they had heard how much the duke had changed lately. Another replied that he had heard that he had found all the knights who took the roof off people and severely punished them. People were obviously not happy about the gathering in the square and could not understand what the duke wanted from them, because they thought that he would starve them again. The old man thought that, in general, he was not surprised by such a reaction from the people, because they did not know anything yet and were used to old Aaron, who did not perform his duties at all. The man began to talk about the fact that intelligence had reported to him that the number of orcs had increased dramatically and they were trying to take away their lands. He also added that if these creatures surround the castle, then the people of Bran's land will no longer be able to receive food. Aaron urged people not to just sit back and wait for death. The people whispered again that the orcs had been doing such things for years and were surprised that their duke had just found out about it. People have already become disappointed again because they thought that their head would say something new and serious. Aaron asked the people if they were going to continue to be victims of these green-skinned orcs or if they would go with their leader to fight for their lives. The people were shocked. They didn't understand why their duke would say that, where he got it from, and what he was going to fight for. After that, Aaron announced that being the lord of these people and the master of the lands, Bran gives a new decree that they will no longer sit in a blind defense against the orcs and from now on they are declared invaders. The people were at a loss and did not understand what invaders meant. Aaron continued his inspiring speech and asked his people how much longer they were going to endure the oppression of the orcs. How much longer will they watch monsters live richer than humans? After this phrase, the people rebelled because they were outraged that some green-skinned orcs lived richer than them, working peasants. Aaron smiled at the fact that people fell for his trick and was delighted with the reaction of people. He reiterated that the orcs live richer than humans and said that he and his people are going to overthrow the orcs so that they all become rich. The people began to chant cut the greenskins, more gold. It was clear that Aaron's speech and the promise of riches had inspired people. There was also a dragon in the body of an old man among the crowd. He was also wearing a robe and hiding his identity behind it. The dragon looked at Aaron and couldn't believe that the man standing in front of him had received his blessing. The dragon smiled and thought that he did not want to stay in these lands for a long time. But this young man has potential. With the help of magic, the dragon formed some kind of parchment scroll in his hand. Some time later, Aaron was yelling at his subordinate. He was talking about how yesterday he ordered him to buy everything. He was asking why the subordinate hadn't even bought a hundred sets of armor. The old man asked about the fact that the expedition might fail, but Aaron stood his ground. Then the old man asked what would happen if she still failed, to which Aaron replied that then he would take responsibility. The old man was outraged that if he bought so much armor and the mission failed, then they would have no money left at all and there would be nothing to eat. Aaron, in a rage, held the old man by his clothes and shouted at him. Then he let him go and they both stood and looked at each other with anger. Suddenly there was a knock on the door. The old man replied that the person who knocked on the door should get out. But Aaron ordered him to enter. The man opened the door and told the duke that a man from Duke Raynon had come to see him. Both Aaron and the old man stood in confusion and looked at the messenger. A dragon in the form of an old man entered the room. He bowed and greeted the duke. The old man held a scroll in his hands and handed it to the duke. He introduced himself as Kynas and said that he had arrived on the recommendation of Duke Raynon. Aaron was surprised to take the scroll from Kynas's hands and asked him again if he had really arrived on Duke Raynon's personal recommendation. Aaron thought about the fact that last time Kynas introduced himself as a strategist, but left them a year later. Aaron was pleasantly surprised to see Kynas and noted that his appearance is hard to forget. Aaron unfolded the scroll and began to read it. In it, Duke Raynon addressed Aaron. He wrote that it had been three years since the man settled in the lands of Bran and there was not a day when he would not be unpleasant to remember that Aaron constantly has to fight for existence in this hell. Then there were a few more lines of text, after which it was said that this time the duke had sent him his promising strategist and some gold for the treasury. Duke Raynon also expressed his wishes that he hopes that Kynas will serve Aaron well in the next three years, and that he and Aaron will meet again someday. After finishing reading the scroll, Aaron thought about how Duke Raynon was devoted to the late emperor. But suddenly it dawned on Aaron that the scroll mentioned gold. He asked Kynas about it. The eyes of the old man with whom Aaron had been arguing a few minutes ago immediately lit up at such news and the mention of money. Kynas laughed softly, waving his fan in his face and said that Duke Raynon had sent 50,000 gold. The old treasurer exhaled and said that he understood such a sum because Duke Raynon was also going through hard times. Aaron turned to the old man and told him not to complain, because with this money you can buy enough equipment and even spend the rest to clean up the city. The old man asked his duke about what he meant by the phrase clean up the city. He replied that this was an investment for the future, because it was unprofitable for their land to keep gold in the treasury and it was better to invest this money in something worthwhile. 
The old man looked at his duke with complete incomprehension as he continued to speak with an intelligent look. Aaron said that if cities are not cleaned up, then frequent outbreaks of diseases will begin and then they will lose the most important resource, which is people. The duke also added that the fewer people they have, the more difficult the distribution of forces will be and eventually it will lead to the collapse of the castle. The dragon, listening to Aaron's speech, mentally noticed that his logic was not entirely correct, but it was much more important that his train of thought was going in the right direction, because few people think as far as Aaron does, and even fewer people remember about hygiene and cleanliness of the city. Maybe Aaron will be suitable for the role of caretaker of the dragon's nest. At that time, the old man left the room and told the duke to do whatever he wanted, because he was quitting. The old man left the room slamming the door and Aaron was left alone with kindness. Aaron looked at the man and was glad that he now had a strategist at his disposal from Duke Rain on himself, and he was already going to memorize strategy textbooks. Very timely, Kynas got to Aaron's castle. The duke turned to Kynas and said that although he was recommended by Duke Raynon, Kynas probably understands perfectly well that Aaron cannot immediately put him as the chief strategist, because the people and the subjects may rebel because of this. Kynas bowed his head and agreed with Aaron's words. After that, the duke continued to speak. He said that based on this, he would be very happy if Kynas showed his skills well in the upcoming campaign against the orcs and then, if he won and succeeded, Aaron would be able to appoint him chief strategist without any problems. The duke asked Kynas what he thought about it. The dragon covered his face with his fan again and agreed with the duke. He said he would be happy to help Aaron in the upcoming campaign. In his mind, the dragon thought that a pathetic person dares to doubt his abilities. He was amused and even interested. Aaron summed it up and said he was relying on Kynas. The man thought to himself that if everything goes well, then he will work with this strategist for the next three years, which is quite a long time. The dragon replied that he would not let the duke down and thought that the better he got to know this man, the more entertaining he would become for the dragon. Suddenly, Aaron added that his goal after the war with the orcs would be to develop dungeons. The dragon was surprised and even a little horrified by such a statement. He asked Aaron again what he meant and whether Kynas understood him correctly. A week later, the army of the Branlands stood in large numbers and fully armed in front of their commander-in-chief, Duke Aaron. The duke said he hoped all the warriors had already learned their strategy by heart. Aaron asked if anyone needed to explain everything again. The warriors remained silent in response. Aaron was satisfied with this answer and said that the army was going on an expedition today. Aaron shouted that they would definitely destroy the evil orcs and then get rich. The warriors liked this fighting spirit, so they raised their spears into the sky and began to shout. The gates of the protective wall of Bran's lands opened and a huge army led by Aaron headed to battle with the orcs. In the black forest of Bran's land, Aaron and Kynas stood on a mountain. They were watching the orc tribe. The leader of this tribe was called Kirok and he captured one citadel in order to build his nest there. Because of the orcs, all the food lines of the land of Bran were destroyed and a few years later, just because of them, a massive famine began, which led to the death of most of the population. Aaron decided that the problem needed to be cut down at the root and that's exactly what he would do. Rommel came up to Aaron and said that their squad had found the cobbled shooters. Aaron asked the man how many of these monsters there were. Rommel replied that they had found five groups and there were about five or six orcs in each of them. Aaron called his sister Cheryl. She came out of the tent and reluctantly approached her brother. He twirled his hand in the air and motioned for her to do what she had to do. The girl took her magic staff and ran into the forest. There she created a fireball of the third circle and said that it was a spell on the third circle, but it hits at the fifth level. After that, she directed the ball towards the orc village. At this time, the monsters were talking in their own language and actively discussing something. Suddenly, they saw a fireball in the sky, which then fell next to them and set fire to the forest. The monsters scattered in different directions due to the explosion. Aaron was watching all this from that very mountain. He was not happy that his sister used some kind of third circle power that hits like the fifth, as he asked her not to use power above the third circle in order not to attract the emperor's attention. The girl returned to her brother while he, covering his face with his hand, thought that if he had known that the girl would use spells stronger than piercing wind, then he would not have taken her with him today. Kynas, who was standing next to the duke, said that the emperor would sooner or later find out what Duke Aaron was doing anyway, and even more so as long as the soldiers did not spread rumors, there should be no problems with this. Aaron exhaled and agreed with the strategist, after which he asked him if he had found the right place. The man replied with full confidence that of course he had found what he needed. The day before the start of the campaign, Kynas, Aaron, Rommel and Cheryl discussed the plan of action in one of the rooms of the castle. The dragon said that the best outcome of the war against monsters would be to destroy them before the start of a real war, so people don't have much choice. He also added that now the best strategy would be to take the enemies to a place convenient for them and destroy them there. 
Aaron asked the strategist what he meant by a convenient place. The man replied that this was necessary in order to eliminate large losses. Tynus also added that the orc tribe has about 2,000 monsters and even if the people of the land of Bran win, the losses will still be incomparable because they have only 500 warriors. After that, Kynus said that besides everything else, since it is people who are attacking, every move needs to be carefully calculated and planned. The man advised to lure out the orcs with the help of cavalry first. Aaron doubted that it was worth using a hundred cavalrymen as bait for monsters, but Kynus convinced him that it was really necessary. Kynus added that since the speed would be on the side of the humans, they would be able to ambush, and then, as soon as the orcs approached the forest, archers and archers would have to destroy at least half of the enemy's army. Then, according to Kynus' plan, the humans would push them into an open area and, with the help of heavily armed knights, surround them in order for them to surrender. Aaron thought for a while, then said that the plan and strategy were excellent. After that, the duke announced that they would proceed according to Kynus' plan. The monsters were trying to escape from the fire that Cheryl had set and escape from this place. Someone from the squad reported to Aaron that apparently the monsters had started moving. Kynus noticed that apparently these are not ordinary orcs, as they even have scouts. This means that the monsters will prepare for battle as soon as they sense something is wrong. After that, the man added that if this was the case, then why not make the developed orcs their slaves? Aaron looked at Kynus questioningly. He continued his speech. He said that in his opinion, such a workforce would help the duke's goal for dungeon development. Aaron was surprised by Kynus's insight and wit. The duke admitted that the idea proposed by the man was really good, but doubted that monsters would obey a man. Aaron said that according to rumors, monsters only listen to the orders of ghosts and dragons. In response, Kynus laughed awkwardly and said that orcs are a species that obeys only superior strength, so it is not necessary to be a dragon at all. Aaron said he would deal with it later, as he did not want his greed to lead to more sacrifices. Kynus agreed to his order. Aaron asked the man if it was time to start their plan. He ordered his sister Cheryl to take 200 soldiers and take up positions in the forest. Aaron ordered Rommel to create an iron ring in an ambush. Both obeyed the duke's order and took action. Aaron told Kynus to stay at the top of the hill, and he also obediently agreed. Aaron signaled to his troops and led them forward with him. At this time, the head of the orcs was having lunch at his castle. A subordinate came running to him and reported that the humans were going to attack them any minute. The trigger got angry at this news and asked about where these people were from. The subordinate replied that the people were attacking from the Black Forest. Huron called the people of Bran's land insects that were hiding behind stone walls and said that they had finally come out. The orc was sure that he would easily kill them all. Another orc ran out into the street and shouted that meat was coming to them. He called on other monster warriors to kill all the people and capture the castle. The warriors began to rejoice in agreement with the head. The trigger ordered the minotaur to be released. The gate was opened and a huge minotaur monster came out of it with an even bigger hammer in his hand. The beast roared very loudly into the sky. The trigger ordered his warriors to kill and loot. A huge and numerous army of orcs, led by their leader Kirk and the minotaur as the main weapon, headed towards the people advancing on them. The sun was already setting below the horizon and was about to hide behind the mountains. A huge bird was flying over the forest when suddenly she heard a noise. Upon closer inspection, the bird discovered that it was a huge army of orcs. It turned out that the eagle served the dragon and therefore he saw everything that the bird saw. The dragon decided that the time had come. At that moment, the army of the people of the land of Bran was running through the forest, led by Aaron. The duke shouted to his men to prepare for a clash and raised his sword into the sky. Aaron shouted forward and the human army collided with the orc army. A brutal massacre began. 100 cavalrymen led by Duke Aaron fought against 200 orcs led by the monster Kira. The battle began. Aaron realized that they were not acting strongly enough and needed to continue to crush the orcs. Suddenly, the man saw a huge axe in front of him and barely managed to hide his head from its blade. A huge minotaur stood in front of Aaron. The monster screamed so loudly that people had to cover their ears with their hands. Aaron shouted to his army not to be afraid of the Minotaur and ordered them to move on towards the orcs. People went on the attack on the monsters again. One of the orcs started attacking Aaron. The duke had already raised his sword to strike, when he suddenly remembered Kynus's words that the orcs could become a good workforce that would help in the development of dungeons. After that, Aaron decided not to kill the orcs, but simply to move them out of his way. The duke realized that they were in the Black Forest, just where they planned to exterminate the orcs. Aaron shouted to his soldiers that there were too many enemies and ordered his army to retreat. The orcs looked at the retreating people with incomprehension. They shouted to each other that the people were running away, and they needed to run after them to kill them. Suddenly, a minotaur broke through the crowd of orcs and began to catch up with the army of people. One of the warriors ran up to the duke and said that they were being followed. Aaron said he would deal with the minotaur and ordered the rest of the warriors to go over the hill. 
The warriors continued to run forward while Eren abruptly turned around and ran towards the Minotaur. At this time, the Minotaur was about to strike one of the warriors. Eren ran and thought that he was not going to lose any of his soldiers. With these thoughts, he used his sword to repel the blow of the Minotaur and his warrior remained alive. The Minotaur flew to the side and fell to the ground. The warriors watched with admiration what Eren had done. The man watched his subordinates and thought that he kind of ordered them to go over the hill, but they did not listen to him. Despite this, Eren was glad that at least he would not have to drag the Minotaur alone, who was unconscious on the ground from the duke's blow. Eren ordered Arthur to tie up this monster and throw it away into the bushes. The man was surprised by such an order from his lord and asked Eren if he was going to kill the monster. Eren calmly replied that he would still need the Minotaur, so he would not kill him. Arthur agreed with his lord and said he would do as he wished. Another warrior told his duke that the orcs were advancing. A crowd of monsters stood and looked at the people, intending to eat every single one. Suddenly, several dozen fireballs began to fall from the sky directly at the orc army. The shells fell to the ground and exploded. Aaron ordered his army to retreat, and he thought that his sister Cheryl was doing something that did not suit him because it killed a lot of orcs. However, the trigger remained alive and was going to run after people to avenge his orc brothers. The warriors had already broken away from the explosion site, when suddenly the trigger and several orcs began to catch up with them. Suddenly, the monster running in front of the chicken rolled back down the mountain towards him. The orc did not understand what was happening until he climbed further and found that in front of him was a wall of shields that people had built. The orcs looked at the people and realized that they couldn't do anything about it. Suddenly, the shields parted and Eren came out of them, straight towards the orcs. He announced to Kurok that he and all his relatives were surrounded, but the duke would give them all a chance to survive. He announced a duel between two chiefs, Eren and Kuroko. As a result of the duel, the winning race will become slaves. The trigger said that the orc did not believe the man. The monster thought that if a person wants to, then all his orcs will be killed, so people cannot be trusted. Eren said he swears by his honor as a warrior, and the trigger will do the same. In response, the orc said that man has no honor. Eren was angered by this statement and ordered his army to close their shields again. Upon hearing this, the trigger growled in displeasure and agreed to a duel. He told Eren to keep his promise. But after that, the trigger with a huge wooden bat in his hands ran to attack the duke. He intended to kill the man without starting a duel. The orc hit Eren with all his might so that the ground on which he was standing crumbled in different directions. But after the dust cloud cleared, it became clear that Eren was standing as before, completely unharmed. This angered the orc and he attacked Eren again. However, the duke managed to dodge again and it seemed that he did not even do anything for it. Eren thought to himself that this was how the dragon's blessing seemed to feel. The old man has not yet fully mastered the duke's body, however, it feels as if it is reacting to the attacks of the orc itself. After Eren dodged the orc's club once again, the trigger called the duke a coward. This angered Eren and hurt his dignity. After that, Eren took the sword in his hands, threw it on the ground and called the chicken a dirty pig, said he would teach him manners. Rommel shouted in horror to his lord asking why he had thrown his sword. In response, the duke told Rommel not to worry, because he would definitely teach this monster a good lesson. The orc growled, saying that there is honor in a man and decided that in that case, he would also drop his weapon. The trigger said that he would break a man with his own hands. Watching the duel between Eren and Kirok, Rommel thought that no matter how strong a man was, anyone without a weapon would lose to an orc. This happens because orcs grow up fighting all their lives. They are stronger than most people. Rommel noticed that even the orc's claws had become sharper, and his lord wasn't even wearing gloves. The trigger was preparing to strike Eren. And at the moment when he began to move his hand towards the duke's face, Eren wondered why the orc was moving so slowly, because Eren was only concentrating on him. Eren dodged the orc's blow, but found himself wondering how hard the monster would hit. Therefore, when the trigger once again prepared his fist to hit Eren, he did not dodge. The orc barely grazed Eren's cheek and he thought that the blow was not at all painful, as expected. The warriors behind Eren whispered. It seemed to them that their lord was really being defeated and they began to think about what would happen to them if Eren really lost. The trigger shouted that he would make all people his slaves. The monster roared and after that his entire army roared. But suddenly Eren ordered the monster to be silent. With great speed, Eren moved from his place and attacked Kirok. He hit him in the face with great force and he flew to the ground. The trigger stood up and shouted that the man was using magic and after that asked Eren about where his honor was. But he only dealt another blow to Kirok with such force that he flew back to the shields of the army of people, but bounced away from them towards Eren. He grabbed the orc's head with his hands and began to strike even more blows. While doing all this, Eren said that today it is the orcs who will become slaves of humans. Unable to withstand such oppression and attacks from Eren, the orc began to beg for mercy. Eren took pity on the chicken. 
After that, the enslavement of the orcs was successfully completed. Aaron was standing on the roof of one of the walls of the orc city. In his hands he held a rope that tied the trigger. The duke was addressing the orcs. He said that he was not going to kill them yet, but from now on they would become slaves of people. A crowd of orcs were watching Aaron. He shouted that from that day on, the orcs would work on Bran's lands. In return, Aaron will give them the right to hunt in the nearby forests. And if their tasks are completed, then people will even share their food with the orcs. However, if even one orc tries to rebel, Aaron will kill them all completely. The duke warned the monsters that he would wring the neck of each of the orcs standing in front of him with his own hands. Aaron asked the orcs if they understood his terms, but the crowd remained silent in response. After that, Aaron grabbed the chicken by the head, raised it higher and said that if the crowd remained silent, then Aaron would do the same to him as to the leader. After that, the orcs shouted that they understood everything and they heard the man. After that, Aaron said that in return for his time spent and as punishment for all their actions, people would take food from the orcs' reserves for themselves. Aaron's army entered the walls of Bran's land. People cheered as they greeted the warriors led by Duke Aaron, his sister Cheryl, Rommel and strategist Kynas. The people praised the duke for the fact that the soldiers returned victorious and they defeated the orcs. Everyone was happy. Aaron ordered Rommel to bring the orcs. In the dungeon, Cheryl made a portal through which all the orcs found themselves in the snow-covered lands. Aaron used a great swordsmanship technique called piercing wind and crushed all the mountains around. The orcs watching were horrified by Aaron's strength. The orcs bowed on their knees to Aaron, while he talked about how from that day on they would serve the great power of the dragon. Aaron ordered the orcs to raise their heads and remember what Aaron had single-handedly done to these mountains and the city. He told the orcs to always remember their place in this world. The next day, Aaron called Kirok to his place. He bowed to Aaron on one knee and said that I would take him and swear not to reveal the duke's power. And if they tried to take revenge, the trigger would stop them. Aaron told Kirok to remember that if even one orc tried to do something, Aaron would destroy their entire species. The orcs fled back to the dungeon, while Kynas approached Aaron. He told the duke that he had indeed been able to subdue the orcs, and that was commendable. Aaron said that apparently the orcs mistook him for a dragon and that made the task easier. Kynas laughed and asked Aaron what he meant by the word dragon. He told Aaron if he knew that dragons never forgive those who pretend to be one of them. In response, Aaron waved his hands and said that Kynas misunderstood him. Aaron said that he did not even mention the dragon. Apparently, the orcs were making up something for themselves, and the duke did not interfere with the flight of their imagination. Kynas laughed and said that it turns out the orcs were just afraid of Aaron's power, to which he replied that Kynas was right and his strength was comparable to that of a dragon. Kynas asked Aaron about what he had said, but Aaron changed the subject. Aaron said he would call a meeting in about an hour and asked Kynas to tell the others about the orcs. He said he would carry out the duke's orders. The old man in the body of Duke Aaron walked and thought that his lord with such strength would be able to protect both his lands and his subject. And even if he couldn't, he would have to at least try. The old man was surprised that the promise to the last king was so important. After that, the old man thought that he was not Aaron anyway and was not going to follow these promises in the same way as the nobles do. His main task now is to protect his subjects in the lands of Bran. The old man decided that he would definitely prepare for a battle with the king, which would solve everything. At the post-war meeting of the duchy, Aaron said that they had successfully completed the military campaign against the orcs without a single loss, and all this was thanks to the strategist Kynas. Cheryl's sister, upon hearing these words, seemed offended and angry that her brother did not mention her, but did not say anything out loud. Kynas also said that he was pleased to hear Duke Aaron's praise, but without his lord, nothing would have happened anyway. Suddenly Cheryl's sister couldn't stand it and told everyone to shut up. She asked angrily and shouted about why no one was praising her, because she bravely blew up the orcs with all her magic. In response, Aaron asked Cheryl about who asked her to blow up everyone there. The duke said that his sister had killed a huge number of orcs, which they could enslave and pump to death with work. In response, the sister began to mimic her brother and pouted resentfully. Aaron continued his speech, summing up everything that happened. He said that now the land available to them has increased fivefold and the duke believes that it is time to discuss the effective use of these lands. Aaron suggested dungeon development. Everyone in the room, including Rommel, looked at Aaron questioningly and asked him what he meant by these words. A man named Max, who is the administrator of the duchy and part-time spy from the poor aristocracy, asked his lord if he was really going to use the dungeons to lure tourists. Aaron turned to Kynas and asked him if he had made a plan. He replied that he was too busy, but still managed to carry out his lord's order. He put a large scroll on the table and said that this was the main plan of the project called Opening and Developing Dungeons. Kynas unfolded a huge scroll. It was so long that he didn't have enough table. Aaron got up from his chair and praised Kynas for the excellent job he had done. 
But later he added that this plan misses two important details. In fear, Kynas asked his lord what he had missed. Aaron shouted that they would probably frame the adventurers, forcing them on the verge of life and death to sign a contract that would force them to be his slaves. Suddenly, Max shouted that making people his slaves would have a bad effect on the reputation of Aaron, who is also an aristocrat. In response, Aaron said that he didn't care about his reputation, since it was more important for him not to starve to death. He also added that even aristocrats are human, and like all of the Lord's subjects, Aaron would die without food, too. Suddenly, Kynas laughed. He apologized and said that his Lord was very good at going beyond simple logic, and this made Kynas laugh. He also said that it was a shame for him that he, the strategist of Kynas, did not understand his master's intentions. He said he would definitely add the treacherous setup of adventurers to the plan. Max clutched his head with his hands and called everything that was happening madness, because at this rate the duchy would definitely come to an end. The next day, Aaron went out into the city. He asked the old man if he was really involved in urban sanitation. The old man said in fear that he was 100% sure that they would not starve to death under Aaron's command, and therefore he would gladly use the entire budget of Bran's lands postponed for the winter for the sake of cleanliness of the city. In response, Aaron said that the food seemed to be there and besides, they had savings. In response, the old man laughed and asked about the savings in question. The old man said that this money was spent on equipment for the war against the orcs because it could not fall from the sky. After that, the old man summed up that in his opinion such a cleaning of the city would be enough and there was no need to spend the castle budget on it anymore. In response, Aaron got angry and said that he had told the old man a hundred times that cleaning was not necessary for beauty but so that people would not get sick. For this reason, you need to clean the city all the time. Aaron ordered the old man to pay the workers with food obtained after the war with the orcs. The old man sighed wearily and said that all of them would soon come to an end. Aaron looked at the city and thought that at this rate they would really run out of food and there would be no sanitation. The duke was thinking about how to solve such a difficult task. At that moment, one of the subjects of Rommel's capital told him that some nun was again illegally arranging treatment. Aaron was interested in this woman. Rommel looked at the crowd of people and told Aaron that, apparently, it was the nun of their Vivian order treating the people again. Aaron reflected on the fact that, according to his memories, the Vivian Order is a religious order that should soon disappear under the pressure of the Paris Order. Suddenly it dawned on Aaron that the girl was treating people. One of Rommel's subordinates began shouting at the people that this was unacceptable, because no one allowed them to use religious magic. The people quickly dispersed, and the members of the Vivian Order began to hide. One of the members of the Order apologized and said that she did not know about such a ban. She said that in that case they would leave. At that moment, people shouted from the crowd. One man begged the priestess to cure his little son, otherwise he would die. Another old man shouted that if Romul's subjects expel the priestesses, then at least let them build a hospital for the people, because this girl somehow helps people and they do not understand why the knights expel her. Another man from the crowd approached the warrior and asked him if he was ready to answer for the death of his son. The girl tried to stop the fight. She said she would come back to them, so people should just wait. Suddenly someone shouted loudly enough, and everyone fell silent. The people looked in the direction from which the voice was coming. Aaron was standing there. He said the nun could continue. Aaron approached the girl and thanked her for helping his subjects. The duke also added that he has no reason to expel the girl from the city and he personally allows her to help his people. People began to cheer joyfully. The girl did not believe the duke's words at first, and then thanked him for the opportunity. Aaron was embarrassed and looked away. He said that the nuns could continue their treatment and the girl needed to go after him. Aaron walked and thought that he didn't care about religion because free treatment was more important. He laughed inwardly and thought that he would make them all plow until they died of fatigue. As soon as Aaron and the nun arrived at the duchy's meeting room, the girl threw herself around Aaron's neck with a hug. Aaron began to push the girl away from him and wondered if she did not know that holy virgins are deprived of God's blessing when they touch men. The girl knelt in front of Aaron and asked him if he really wanted to build a temple. Aaron began to drink tea and said that he really wanted to do this and saw no reason not to build a temple. The girl was very happy, but suddenly an old man appeared who said that they could not build a temple because they simply did not have the money for it, and if they build it, they will have absolutely nothing left in their treasury. Aaron said he knew all this, but they must have had hidden savings somewhere. In response, the old man angrily shouted that the last emperor had left this money to Aaron in order to use it as a last resort. In response, the duke shouted that the emergency had come. The old man bowed quietly to his duke and said that he would do his bidding. The girl began to thank Duke Aaron endlessly for such a decision. But the man stopped her and said that for such generosity he had one condition for the Order of Vivian. The girl asked what the condition was. Aaron said that his condition was the production of holy water. The duke said that according to rumors that had reached him, holy water could be created directly in the temple. 
Aaron asked the girl if she was ready to promise her help in developing the lands of Bran and producing holy water in exchange for building a temple. The girl gladly agreed and said that she would fulfill her promise. Aaron asked the girl what if they had to produce as much holy water as Aaron wanted. In response, the girl agreed again. A few weeks later, Kynas ran up to his duke and reported that the orcs had discovered a hidden dungeon and it was located next to their fortress. Aaron asked Kynas about which dungeon he was talking about. Kynas said that according to Kirok, this is some kind of long abandoned place. In response, Aaron asked if this had been mentioned in any ancient writings and if this place had no owner at all. Kynas replied that they had found absolutely nothing. He also added that, apparently, now this dungeon has become a den of a wide variety of creatures. The strategist asked his lord if they would develop such a place, because it is difficult for Kynas to imagine how adventurers can be lured there. Aaron reflected that no one would believe that a high-ranking dungeon had just appeared, even if they made it out of an abandoned one. Suddenly Aaron remembered the nun. The duke laughed and said that he had come up with a great idea and had found a way to lure adventurers there. Aaron said that they would spread a rumor about the elixir of eternal life, which could supposedly be found there. Kynas said they didn't have anything like that. Yano, in response to this, the duke said that they actually had one such thing at their disposal and called the strategist to follow him. When Kynas came to the temple, he saw how the girl treats people and was very surprised. He can't understand what kind of glow it is, what kind of divine power that literally bursts out of the girl's body. Kynas couldn't figure out where this creature came from in these lands. The girl immediately ran towards her master as soon as she heard his footsteps. A strong light emanated from the girl, which blinded Kynas's eyes, but he very soon realized that people did not feel this divine power. The girl immediately threw herself on her master's neck, but he moved aside and she fell on the grass. Aaron asked the girl how her business was going. Privately, the duke thought that he should not forget that Cecilia is a cheap producer of holy water for Aaron. The girl said that as the duke could see, they had almost finished building the temple. Aaron said that he came to find out about the holy water and asked the girl if she could already create it. In response, the girl said that she certainly has such an opportunity. The girl sat down on her knees and began to pray. She turned to the goddess Vivian and said that her devoted servant had come with a plea. The girl asked to give her a piece of her energy and create a miracle. After that, the water in the thicket in front of the statue of Vivian lit up. All the people standing and watching were shocked. The dragon thought that this was impossible, because this force is inhuman and, apparently, Cecilia is a direct descendant of the goddess. The dragon wondered if the girl hadn't woken up yet. Aaron filled the bucket with water and told the old man to try the water, because he was the oldest and sickest of all those present and the effect would be most noticeable on him. The old man took the ladle in his hands with skepticism. He said that he did not believe that simple water could cure, unlike real medicines. The old man took a sip of water and immediately felt five years younger. Now he could jump, jump, do somersaults and almost sit on the splits. Cecilia asked Aaron if her water was better than real medicine. The girl took the guy by the hand and began to stroke him. Aaron panicked and began to push the girl away from him. The duke thought that he just needed to pour some holy water into the dungeon and spread the rumor about the source of eternal life there. But he also noted that the effectiveness of this water is amazing. The guy decided that in this case it was necessary to keep Cecilia. He made a reservation and corrected himself, his cheap producer of holy water, as close to himself as possible. At this time, the girl was still standing close to Aaron, and it was clear from the duke's face that he was embarrassed by such attention from the girl and he was embarrassed. Aaron called Kynas over to him. The duke whispered to his strategist about how hard it would be to spread such a rumor about the elixir. Kynas replied that he was sure there was no such powerful holy water anywhere else. The strategist also added that, of course, water does not grant eternal life, but even this effect is enough for adventurers. Aaron said that since everything was ready, in that case it would be time for them to go to the dungeon. Suddenly Cecilia ran up to her master and said that she had just remembered that she would like to introduce him to someone. Aaron was surprised and asked the girl who she was talking about. Cecilia replied that she wanted to introduce the man to the captain of the holy knights of her order. Aaron was surprised and asked the girl if he had heard that the Vivian Order had holy knights. It turned out that the Order of the Holy Knights really exists. And, unlike other specialized warriors, they are responsible for defense. These people dedicate their bodies to the divine in order to withstand and repel absolutely any kind of attacks. If such knights unite together, then their defense will not be inferior in strength even to a fortress. However, Cecilia sighed sadly and said that they only had one of the knights left. Aaron asked the girl if the captain would come to them. Suddenly, someone called out to Aaron, calling him a red-haired boy. The duke looked in the direction from which the voice came and saw a girl in armor there. She told Aaron to stop crowding up to their saint, because he was not worthy to stand even close to her. The duke looked at the knight with an offended expression. She continued to speak and said that she had come only because the Holy Virgin had decided to build a temple in the lands of Bran. 
She called this place dead, with weak people and a useless duke, just a pathetic sight. At that moment, Cecilia flew up to the knight and called her Lady Bianca, saying that she could not talk to her master like that, because it was rude. Aaron, with a calm voice, asked the girl what she meant when she called his people weak. Bianca replied that she really considered their people weak and added that she was ready to obey only the strongest. In response, Aaron, with the same calm face and even a little bored, asked the girl about how many people she had already obeyed in her entire life. The girl shouted that so far no one has been awarded such an honor, because no one will be able to match her strength. Aaron smiled and asked the girl if she wanted to make a bet. Bianca was surprised and asked Aaron what he meant. He replied that the loser of the bet would receive three strong blows from the winner and after that they would see if Bianca would obey the Duke of Bran's land. Bianca looked at the Duke with contempt and called him an infirm brat. The knights stood around Aaron and Bianca, while they stood opposite each other and prepared for battle. One of the knights said that it was painful for him to watch a battle in which the winner was obvious. Another replied that the master had defeated that orc Kirok with the help of the magic of deafening sleep and even fought without a sword. The third knight asked what would happen if Aaron or Bianca got badly hurt during the fight. The first one replied that they had nothing to do but pray. Aaron bent down to the ground to pick up a thin branch. Bianca was offended and angered by this, because the duke was going to fight against her with some kind of branch from a tree. In response, Aaron laughed it off and told the branch not to listen to the bad ant. At that moment, Bianca turned to the goddess Vivian and asked her to give her the strength to crush her enemies. Aaron asked the girl why she had been preparing for the attack for so long. Was she afraid of the stick? The girl got angry and shouted at the duke to shut up. The girl began to attack Aaron with all her might, but he stopped her with just a stick. Bianca bounced off Aaron and flew into the camp. In response, Aaron, with a grin and mockery, asked the girl if one blow of a branch was enough for her. After that, the duke hit Bianca with a branch once more and her shield began to crumble. As a result, it completely broke into small pieces. The girl fell to her knees and bowed to Aaron. At that moment, the duke said that according to the conditions that they both remember, the loser must withstand three strong blows from the opponent. He ordered Bianca to expose herself. The duke struck Bianca three times with a stick, while all the knights were watching. After that, Aaron announced that the punishment was over and told Bianca never to insult him on his own land again. The girl sighed, barely gathered the strength to get up from the ground and turned to Aaron. She said that no one had ever humiliated her so cruelly and asked the duke to make her his slave. But before the girl could finish, Cecilia closed her mouth. Aaron was surprised by such a request from the captain of the order and asked her about what she had said. Cecilia continued to cover Bianca's mouth and laughed and said that the captain of the Order of Holy Knights must have been slightly carried away by reading her favorite novels. Aaron was still standing in surprise and did not understand what kind of novels Bianca was reading. The Duke ordered Rommel to assemble a warrior to clear the dungeon. Aaron stood in front of his warriors. He turned to Kynas and said that by removing the soldiers needed to defend the borders, they only had a hundred warriors left, which was too few. In response, Kynas said that only 5,000 people live on the land of Bran and by law they mobilize every tenth, so it turns out that a large army needs a huge population, which the lands of Bran do not have. After that, Kynas said that even if they suddenly have new residents, they will not have enough resources to feed them. Aaron thought about it and realized that in order to attract more residents, it is necessary to first improve living conditions. Kynas said that he would try to find a way to remedy the deplorable situation. Aaron agreed with the strategist. Suddenly, Aaron realized something. He decided that if he was not mistaken, then just at this time there would be many refugees in the territory of Count Grey and Count M. Kynas noticed that his master was thinking and asked him what he thought. At that moment, Aaron realized that it was time for him to give his speech to the warriors. Aaron began to say that, as they had all heard, they were going to go to the dungeon. He also added that they would clean up everything there and take the treasures with them. After that, the warriors headed for the dungeon with Aaron. There were orcs at the entrance to it. They bowed to their overlord and greeted him. Aaron asked the orcs about how it went there. Suddenly, the trigger said that something had happened. After that, they headed to the second floor of the dungeon in the holy lands of Atuna. The orc pointed at his brothers lying on the ground and said that they had become somewhat strange. Cheryl asked the others if everyone was feeling this strange chill that she was feeling. These orcs stood up and looked at the people. Their eyes were glowing purple. The orcs headed towards the humans and were about to attack them. The trigger shouted for his brothers to stop, otherwise Aaron would kill them all and beat off the orcs from the overlord with a club. They fell and crashed into the wall. Some kind of black spirit flew out of them. Kynas warned everyone to be careful, because these are ghosts. The ghost flew through Kirok's baton, despite the fact that he was trying to protect his master. The ghost flew to Aaron, but with the help of a sword was able to repel the attack. A bunch of ghosts surrounded the people in the dungeon. 
Cheryl thought that she would still have nightmares about these creatures. The girl released a fireball from her magic staff and it crushed several ghosts. Rommel called out to Mrs. Cheryl and asked her for help, since neither he nor the trigger can harm these ghosts in any way. After that, Kynas said that he forgot to mention that only magic can hurt ghosts. Rommel said that such an important detail could have been said earlier. Cheryl ordered everyone to stay put and not move. After that, she fired another stream of fire from her staff towards the ghosts, and they flew away. After that, they gathered into one lump and let out a long-drawn howl, so loud that everyone in the dungeon had to cover their ears. After that, one huge ghost reappeared and Aaron cut it with his sword, charged with the fire of his sister Cheryl. Kynas said that it seemed that the ghosts stayed in this place for a reason, because maybe they were even guarding something. Cheryl called out to her brother to come to her. The girl was holding a book in her hands and reading it. After her brother approached her, she showed him the title of the book, which read Legacy of the Ancients. The girl was reading a book and said that during the time of the Dragon Empire, there was a temple of some group of monks in this place, and she also saw about the training of spiritual power. Aaron asked about these workouts. Cheryl began to read that unlike magicians using external force, these monks were able to experience the power of a different nature, spiritual. Aaron said it was the first time he had heard of inner strength. In fact, the external power of magicians is a vessel that is filled with mana and they receive it from birth, and spiritual power is a vessel that can be increased and changed. Aaron turned to Kynas and asked him if he had ever heard of such art. The man replied that it was quite entertaining. He added that if everything was exactly as a mess. Cheryl explained, then thanks to spirit training, even an ordinary person would be able to use magic. Aaron asked Kynas if this meant that his soldiers could also master this magic. Kynas cautiously replied that even if that was the case, he didn't think it was worth trying yet. Aaron asked why Kynas felt that way. He replied that if you examine the dungeon, you can see blood and traces of endless struggle everywhere. Kynas suggested that the training of this force was so inhuman, or the force itself was so dangerous that in the end they all just killed each other. Aaron thought about it, looked at the book and said he would hide this thing for now. At this time, on the third level of the dungeon, Kynas and other people were destroying the dungeon and found a chest with a lot of gold. Aaron said that since they were done, the trigger would take only half of the gold in the chest and leave the rest in it. Kynas turned to Aaron and said that he would like to take half of the gold. Aaron asked him what the gold was for. Kynas said that since this dungeon is pretty simple, it will be difficult to put the adventurers in a critical position. Aaron thought about it and agreed with Kynas. He went on to say that therefore, with the help of this gold, he would be able to add several additions to the dungeon. Aaron asked Kynas what kind of additions he wanted to make. As a result, the orcs built a maze in it under the guidance of Kynas. He looked at the work done, the work of the orcs and said that when the foundation of the labyrinth is done, he is an ancient dragon, orders all the dead to rise up. After that, he added a couple of torches and a well with magic water. Kynas tasted the water, said that it had a good taste and it would prolong life for about a year. All that remained was to find greedy customers. The adventurers crowded in front of the gate leading to the entrance to the dungeon. One of the adventurers noted that it was pouring like a bucket and thought about when this winter would end. He also noted that all the guards in this place are dressed in brand new armor. Another adventurer suggested that maybe they had found something in this new dungeon, such as an artifact. The girl also added that if things are different, then she does not understand why so much money was needed. After that, the adventurer pointed to the tavern and asked the girl if this was also an unnecessary waste in her opinion. The man noted that other buildings are still under construction, and the tavern looks like new. The adventurer said that this means that they are happy to wait for people like them. Or more precisely, they are waiting for the gold that they will spend in this tavern on alcohol and food. The second adventurer said that if that was the entrance fee to the dungeon, then he would spend quite a lot of money there. After that, the adventurers entered the tavern and the owner greeted the adventurer, calling him by name Gerald. The man also greeted the owner in response and asked him how many people he had robbed to rebuild such a good and beautiful tavern. But there is also a hotel on the second floor. The owner replied that he had not robbed anyone in any case and all the money had been borrowed. After that, he changed the subject and asked the adventurers if they had heard that a new dungeon had appeared, which would soon attract many adventurers to his tavern. Because of this, the man recommended that young people hurry up while there is time. Gerald said he didn't expect to be rushed and he laughed. The adventurer looked around, took out a gold coin from his pocket, handed it to the tavern owner and asked him what he knew about the new dungeon. He replied that he had heard rumors about the source of eternal life, but so far these adventurers are the first who are going there. After that, Gerald gave the tavern owner another gold coin and thanked him for the information provided and added that he never lets him down. He asked the owner to bring him something to eat, because they want to enrich this tavern. The next day, in the morning, Aaron was sitting in the lotus position, a book was opened in front of him, in which he read about spiritual power. 
The duke thought that so far he could only use the blessing of the dragon in full force, and Kynas correctly noted that these teachings could be dangerous, but Aaron needed his own strength, his personal one. At that moment, Cecilia came up to Aaron and disturbed his meditation. Aaron was startled by the surprise and asked the girl about what had happened and what she needed from him. Cecilia said that she had come to express her feelings for him in some way. The girl handed the guy a plate with sandwiches on it. Aaron took this plate, but suddenly one of the warriors came running to him to report something, and so Cecilia left. The warrior informed his master that the adventurers had arrived. In response, a joyful Aaron asked the warrior about how many slaves there were. The next day, a crowd of adventurers rushed to the dungeon called the Atuna Spring. The adventurer noticed a sign that said that the entrance fee was 10 gold. The girl paid her money, and in response, they handed her a payment paper and told her not to lose it, since it is her pass to the dungeon. Gerald wanted to enter the dungeon, but the warriors blocked his entrance and told him that it was impossible to enter the dungeon without paper. Gerald started to say something, but the warriors interrupted him and reminded him again that you need to pay 10 gold pieces to enter. Other adventurers began to mutter discontentedly and say that this was robbery. Another said that with this money you can feed a family for three months and this is some kind of divorce. After that, the warrior announced that he was now declaring the words of the owner of the brand lands, Duke Aaron. You can always earn 10 gold, but the elixir of eternal life can be exhausted at any moment. Decide for yourself what is more precious to you. After that, Gerald took out a bag of money from his pocket and handed it to the warrior. After the adventurers entered, they were told that there are many dead people in the dungeon and if they want to overcome them, they only need a special holy water, which costs one gold piece. Gerald said that he already had water and showed him a bottle with it. The one who sold the water said that it was water from the Paris church and called the adventurers poor devils who did not know that the holy water of the Vivian church was much stronger. Gerald stopped, thought about it, gave the seller some gold coins and took the water. The seller thanked him and took the money. He also started trying to sell magic equipment and Gerald asked to see it. After that, Gerald saw a sign that said that an emergency rescue request was worth 100 gold coins per person. The seller gave Gerald some kind of artifact and began to assure him that this was not a divorce. The man said that this is a special artifact designed specifically for adventurers and with only 100 gold pieces he can save his life. Gerald asked what would happen if they didn't make the request. In response, the seller said that then no one would charge them money. Gerald thought that if they really found a source of eternal life there, they would get rich 10 times more than they would spend here. After that, all the adventurers finally entered the dungeon. At that moment, Aaron and Kynas were happily watching the adventurers enter the dungeon. Aaron called Kirok over and told him that the holy water would simplify the battle with ghosts too much for adventurers. And therefore, the duke asks the orc to go to the dungeon and heat up the situation there. At this time, on the second floor of the dungeon, the adventurer was using ice arrows to fight monsters and fight her way to the source. Gerald thought that if they didn't have this holy water, then everything would be much more complicated. The adventurers, led by Gerald, stood near the stairs and wondered if it led to the last floor. Suddenly, more ghosts flew towards the adventurers, who were already ready to attack them. One of the men shouted at them that they were stupid creatures and threw a bottle of holy water at them. She crashed into the ghost, but did nothing. As a result, the ghost attacked the man and he flew down the stairs. The other adventurers were scared. They realized that these were mutant ghosts and Gerald ordered everyone else to get their weapons. However, after that, several more ghosts ran out. Gerald got scared, said there were too many monsters and ordered all the other people to run. After that, the orcs pulled off their blue cloaks, which made it seem like they were ghosts. 